appreciate you uh, appreciate you coming on the pod. Appreciate you coming. Uh, obviously, we uh, we've been collabing for a little bit now, but a chance to dive into to the backstory. Um, hear a little bit about yourself before we dive in too much. You know, give the audience a little thirty second kind of elevator pitch on on yourself and 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 what you're up to. All right, cool. Yeah, um, I was uh, born in New York City. Uh, lived in Canada for some time. Um, did most of my living in Boston. Uh, around the age of nine, my parents got tired. Me and my brother beating each other up with toy lightsabers. Uh, huge Star Wars fan here, still am still today. And uh, so they signed us up for sport fencing. Um, and the rest is history. I um, started at a small club out in Boston. Uh, went to Penn State, two-time national champion, um, four-time uh, senior world uh, world team, um, six-time junior cadet world team member, uh, and just recently uh, junior um, the uh, Olympic member in Tokyo 2020. Shaking off the junior. There's no more junior. <laughs> yeah, shaking off the junior. The, the, the yeah, real deal. Right. So, well, what age again did you get? Did you get into into fencing? So I started when I was. Around nine years old, nine years old. Nine years old. Yeah. Now, before that, was there any experience? Like, did you play any other sports beforehand, or was fencing one of the first sports that you were introduced? How did you? Um, no, when I when I you think soccer moms are crazy in America, you should like try to intervene with hockey moms in Canada. That's a, that's a whole other story right there that I can get into. Um, but I did play some hockey when I was in Canada. It wasn't really good. I was told by other parents to just try figure skating. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, um, but I played soccer. I was really good at soccer. Loved the sport. Still watch it till this day. Um, but um, when I first started fencing when I was nine, I didn't really like it because it wasn't a it wasn't like a recreational sport. The club I joined was more for you know if you're going to join this club, it's for big expectations. You're going to work hard here and make something out of it. And then as time went on, um, I realized you know I had a, a natural talent for a sport. And I can make something out of it. So I steered away from the sport of soccer that I love and uh, pursued um, the sport that I'm in today. And so you you said that that was around nine where you really kind of got into fencing. I'm curious, um, you know, you, you said you had a passion, you had a love for soccer. What was it about, what was it about, you know, a, you know, either going from hockey yeah. to soccer? How did you, how did you? kind of develop a love and a passion was it just the game itself was it your teammates was it kind of the age range you know that that you were playing and talk yeah. about a, a little bit about you know just i didn't like fencing at first yeah um because i just wanted to whack the other person <laughs> that, <laughs> that lightsaber that, that lightsaber yeah that exactly man um <laughs> But it was around the age of like 15 in, uh, when I first started going to high school. Um, and I just started making my cadet uh, 16, 17 and under um, world team and traveling internationally. It was kind of hard to pick, you know, go to soccer practices and go to my soccer games as well as, you know, doing my fencing endeavors. Um, and it was a challenging point where I was like, shoot, like I really love like the team aspect and, you know, having uh, playing along with the team. Um, but something like the fact that like you're by yourself on the fencing strip and everything's come to you, like you are in power of all the movement and everything you can do. So all your achievements and failures is on you. You can't point fingers left or right. And something about that kind of attracted me to it. So I stuck with it. The ultimate accountability, right? And, uh, yeah, ultimate accountability. in yeah, the solo you. sport. So Curiously, how, how were you introduced to fencing? You mentioned that you were introduced to the sport, started playing. I didn't really like it at first, but, you know, how, how were you initially introduced to the sport of fencing? Uh, so my older sister was swimming for our high school, but the high school um, pool was closed for reconstruction. And there was an ad for a fencing club uh, a few towns over from ours, and she signed up. And... Um, uh, having such small these sports, my parents were like, oh, this might be something that, you know, our kids are interested in because they love Star Wars. And uh, yeah, so they signed us up and took away the toy lightsabers. <laughs> they took away the toy lightsabers. Excuse me. I'm going to shut this. My golden retriever puppy going nuts at the, the UPS guy walking up. But um, no, no um, but uh, so took it away. So basically it was swimming you know, isn't available. So we got to find something else to throw Andrew and, and big sis in. And that happened to be fencing. 
Um, you mentioned at first you didn't really like the sport. Eventually, you know, grew to love it. What what was it about it? Was it you know the person who was running the club? Did they have great experience, and you were able to start to learn about that? You mentioned it was kind of you know you love the full accountability. Was it kind of a growing understanding of um, how the, how the sport was and your skill set? What what it, what initially started to turn over the leaf of just something that you did to something that you progressively became more and more passionate about? Yeah. So at first, doing a sport, small niche sport, especially like fencing. Um, uh, all your friends from school are doing, you know, baseball, football, soccer after school, and um, you're going to a club a few towns over to uh, try this new sport. Um, so I was kind of upset, you know, when you're young, you're like, oh, I'm missing time with my friends. But as you get older, you realize your friends are still going to be there regardless of what sport you're playing. For sure. <laughs> um, but when I, like I said, when I first started at the club, you are there to work hard and make something out of it. It's not, you know, you go there just for fun and recreation. Now, now, when you say that, were there like, did it have an established, you know, reputation or credibility from fencers that who were at the club? So, or? Yeah, so the cool thing is the club had no reputation yet. My coach did because he was um, coach at Harvard University and um, Stanford. And he won several NCAA championships with both teams there and was an Olympic coach. Um, back in the day in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, and so he had a reputation, but the club didn't have much of a reputation yet. And it's crazy. I've been there for 17 years. My coach is like a second father to me. And um, me and my other teammate, we kind of made a name and a mark in Boston for fencing with our achievements that we've had for all different age groups. And uh, everything is accountable. Um, Till today so i'm gonna i'm gonna try to keep up with the timeline that we're talking on yeah, so, oh that. no not at all no this is, this is what it's for it's you know so we get into fencing call it nine ten years old we start getting better say middle school and high school what mm -hmm. you know talk about i guess a, a match or a practice or an instance where as you're developing kind of middle school into high school where yeah. you know you you realize like you mentioned that you had some skill sets, you had some talents, you know, when did you first kind of realize that, you know, this is something that I could be pretty special at? Um, so going back to like how, uh, you know, we joined the club, it's about, about expectations. Um, it's my coach was very big on detail and discipline. Um, the, the way you carry yourself wasn't just in the gym, but outside of the gym too. It's a persona, it's a, a gentleman's sport, it's an honor sport. So there's a certain way to carry yourself in and outside of the fencing venue. Um, and, you know, as I got older, I realized, um, I think it was around like, uh, can you hear me? Yep, I got you. Yeah, uh, I think it was around like, I was 15 years old. I was really bad at fencing until like, end of middle school i was really bad <laughs> like the, light, the lightsaber now, too much you were trying to yeah my my buddies that i have now on the team would used to kick my ass um can i say that yeah i think i can say that right okay cool <laughs> they used to kick my ass back at uh, when we were like 14 15 just before high school and then um i qualified for my first international cadet competition in poland and I wasn't supposed to go, but not enough people signed up. So, you know, they go down the ranking system and I was able to go. And I don't know, I think something about being in that space and having the opportunity to be in Poland, I kind of like mentally shocked myself and put myself in a position where I was like, wow, like if I, if I like had this opportunity, I shouldn't let it go to waste. And I got bronze at that competition which was my parents didn't believe it. My, <laughs> my teammates also were like, what the hell? Who is this new guy that's fencing? Um, but like right after that, like I kind of like slingshot forward and it was like result after result after result. And I realized like the more I put into it, the more I'm going to get out. So I think at that point is when I was like, hey, you know what? I'm just going to focus directly on just in fencing and um, make the most out of it. Well, and, and talk a little bit about the elements that go into fencing. <laughs> Obviously you said there's a way to carry yourself, you know, on and off, you know, the, 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 the court, right. I don't know yeah, if, yeah. if it's the court, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Fencing strip. On it's and strip. off the strip. Right. But as yeah. you start building that momentum, you know, what was starting to build, was it, you know, 
I guess talk a little bit about you know fencing in general, the offensive side, the defensive side in terms of you know within the match with within kind of um, you know you facing off going one on one. What are the elements that can make up kind of a win or loss, and where you were able to start to really build off of the um, you know the the things that you were doing well that were resulting in in wins. Yeah. Um, what I like to say is fencing is a physical game of chess. Um, you have to constantly kind of like formula one drivers where they're constantly thinking, um, and thinking about like the next move they're going to be doing. It's just like in fencing as well. You're not just thinking that one touch that's happening in a few seconds or, right or boxing, setting stuff up, right. Setting, setting up maybe yeah. jabs, seeing how people react to then counter. Exactly. Um, but not like but but not like boxing where you can like you know move around and get a feeling like right when the referee says fence you have to jump in and be able to respond right away um so it's a constant battle between making sure you're in the right distance and if you can push the your opponent in attack or you know defend yourself going backwards um so in fencing there's a rule called the right of way if you're on the attack and someone's going back and you both score whoever is going forward has priority um, they have the right of way, so it's their touch. So whenever you're in defense, kind of like in football, you have to find a way to like stop your opponent, um, block your opponent, make them miss, kind of like you know make them fumble or get fourth down, um, uh, just anything to the, get the ball back and make sure you're going back on the offense so you can score and get the opportunity to uh, get some points up. Gotcha. No, that that makes a lot of sense. And you know, for, for the listeners, I definitely want to outline kind of all of these nuances that are that are super important. So, for sure. so you you would say that where you started to become better is understanding kind of the mix and match of the offense and the defensive side and putting yourself in those, you know, kind of scoring positions. How uh, how are you able to use kind of that mental aspect to start to create those type of advantages? Were there kind of moves that you started to develop that you built off of? You know, were those really new to the sport? Were they unique to yourself? Um, were they things that you learned from other people? How did you really start? To- so I was, a, I'm still am a huge Cristiano Ronaldo fan. And when I was growing up watching him, like and seeing how unorthodox he played by taking like risky long shots um, or just, um, you know, his footwork and his tactics and constantly keeping his points on his toes is definitely something I took into my own fencing style. I definitely would say my fencing style is a little unorthodox to the traditional way of people fencing. I like to do high risk, high reward. Um, so I do like a lot of radical like um, parries, uh, so blocks in the middle, but very close. Um, uh, kind of like in boxing, you know, you want to if you keep close con- uh, close distance with your opponent, you make them uncomfortable, uh, and then you can react to it. Just anything of fencing, I kind of like to close that gap for my opponent. So you're like um, like a Mike Tyson. You're trying to get up. You're- yeah, listen, I'm throwing a one-two side hit and then, you know, sneak up underneath of an undercut right underneath the jaw. Bam, exactly. But you're, you're, you're kind of using a combination of your skill sets and catching people off guard and really dictating, you know, the momentum of, of a match and, and kind of a match-by-match yeah. match base, basis. So, um, so around, I guess, we're now in, you know, 15, 16 years old. We've earned bronze. We're starting to pick up momentum. Um, I'm curious, you went into, you know, obviously all of the accolades that you had, but eventually going on to play at Penn State, um, something that, you know, we talk a lot about is, you know, recruiting and, and getting an opportunity, getting a scholarship, you know, mo- you know, our familiarity and my familiarity specifically is on the football landscape, but talk a little bit about as you started to find success, I guess, when you started to see more of the opportunities that you could capture through fencing, starting with a scholarship. Yeah. Um, so my process getting to uh, universities was uh, fairly simple, honestly. Um, like I was a very well uh, driven student in the classroom, um, but in my fencing endeavors, my results spoke for themselves. Um, uh, I didn't really have to do much outreach in terms of um, looking for universities that wanted me. It was quite the opposite universities were emailing me asking if they can have a sit down or a, a call. Um, and what, so what, what, what year were they starting to reach out to you um, in your, progr- in your career, whether what grade year in high school? So I knew freshman year of high school, when you're going to competitions, domestic competitions, there are college coaches there. 
because uh, they have their own um, athletes in NCAAs also competing um, for the national team as well. Uh, so they're, you know, they're scouting you out. They're looking, they're getting a glimpse of you. Um, and, you know, when he sees this name rep repeatedly, you know, up on the metal boards, um, you get quite a good awareness for yourself. Um, but they didn't reach out until like junior year is when things started like, really picking up and I was getting different offers and different universities were asking me to come visit, get an official um, trip to go see the campus and meet the, the coaches and the uh, facility as well. And that was really cool. Um, definitely was really nice to see different parts of the country and see how like different campuses were. What, what different visits did you take? What? So I went to Ohio State, um, uh, Columbia, Notre Dame, um, Penn State, um, and a few other schools as well. But um, I had a feeling I was going to go to Penn State for a while. Um, something about it really attracted me. Honestly, I think it was the color blue. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Maybe blue. Hey, Penn, State, yeah. Penn State was my favorite team growing up. I, I used to go to yeah. games. We are. My my uncle was a professor. That was like, oh, let's go. That was um, that was where I wanted to play my college ball. They told me I was a little too small. You know, Big Ten football. There's there's big guys. I'm about six three. I wasn't a, the monster that that they were looking for in the middle, but. I got my revenge. We went up to Happy Valley my sophomore year and 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 took it to the the Nittany Lions, which was kind of bittersweet. But definitely understand the allure and the, and the history of Penn State. But um, you know, I'm curious of of what you know. You joked around the Navy, you know, being the Navy blue. But but what made you fall in love? Your, or what kind of initially caught your allure and attention? And I guess what solidified your decision. <clears throat> um. Definitely the atmosphere around the team. Um, I think if you have a very close knit team that want to engage with each other, uh, want to stay close and have the community built within the team that kind of reaches outside that other people can look at as examples at Penn State was one of the biggest things I took uh, looking into colleges. Um, and also the campus. I mean, Penn State was a beautiful campus. I, I visited it around the fall time and I was like, wow, like I can totally see myself walking to class in this kind of weather. Um, I had a few thoughts my first winter when I went to Penn State, especially trudge, like, you know, trying to get through the snow and everything. But putting that to the side, I, um, the facility, the coach and everything, um, they made the whole team when I went there to, um, and visited, they made me believe that I could achieve things that I didn't think I could achieve before going to Penn State. So you would say that it really helped you kind of in your career in the development of your, um, you know, of where you stood kind of in the fencing world. What 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 allowed you to kind of continue developing? Was it your teammates? Was it the quality that you were kind of facing on a day to day basis? Was it the coaching? Was it kind of the competition naturally allowed you to kind of raise your game? What would you say, you know, really helped you develop? Um, I kind of think teammates and coach uh how practices are run go hand in hand um it's just as important to make sure that practices are ran to the highest degree and also having teammates that are putting the same amount of work as the person left to the right of them um you know when one person gets gets caught slipping um it kind of is like a domino effect and you see people slowly kind of mentally um zoning out of it uh, so it's very important to like make sure you go into a place where you know teammates are going to be holding each other accountable. Um, and I don't know, another thing I learned when I went to school there was it's not, you know, practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice makes perfect. Um, you can be going to practice and being nonchalant um, in whatever sport it is and not get anything out of it, but just say, oh, I went to practice. But it's not going to get you anywhere. It's it's really the time of commitment that you put in those, in those uh, training sessions, whether it's in the gym, um, the the sports specific training, um, you know, uh, taking uh, getting good night rest, uh, diet, all that comes hand in hand, and that's what really excels people forward. Um, and like, when you have all that together, and you feel good about yourself, it's honestly you're just helping your mental muscle too. Like you're you're helping your mentality just push forward above and beyond. Yeah, oh, and it sounds like teammates resonating. Obviously, you you had played soccer in your early years and some other team sports when you can really feel and, and you're dependent yeah. as it's going on. But, you know, uh, I guess give a little color, or give a little context for, for the audience in terms of 
how teammates, how things work and interact on a team? Is it more like wrestling where each individual is going on with their specific match? You're kind of, you know, ranked within your team in a certain kind of order and you're going to match up with that that type of ranking from the other side and then you have your individual matches, you know, how, how I guess would. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's very similar to wrestling in terms of like you compete individually, but you represent the team as a whole. Yep. Um, so there's three different principles in fencing, Sabre, Foil, and Epe. Each one has a little different uh, rule change to them within it. Um, but you only stick to competing against people in the same principle as you. And so we'll have like meets, um, I guess other universities and it's kind of round robin you fence everyone. so almost a little almost a little even like tennis in the sense that there's singles and doubles yeah. and 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 there's kind of different nuances within the the entire team and, and the disciplines yeah yeah exactly um and then you know through those meets um depending what your record is your win lose ratio you qualify for regionals and then um, from regionals, you qualify for national championships. Gotcha. Talk a little bit about any, you know, I always think of in, in sports, you mentioned in soccer, Cristiano Ronaldo, but like the elite, the elite people in sports that you may look up to, that you may be striving to be like that. Um, you know, who was that in fencing or, or who, who, who did you look up to? Who was in your discipline that, you know, was the greatest or a great that you really respected their game and tried to emulate in different ways? Uh, it's this Italian fencer named Aldo Montano. Aldo Montano. Uh, yeah. Uh, he still, I th think he just retired after Tokyo. Um, but yeah, he had this cool swagger like to him. Um, uh, and he never looked like he was nervous. He, even when things weren't going his way, he looked good losing. Like, it was incredible. Um, smooth. He was smooth. Very smooth. And he looked so beautiful on the strip. Uh, very clean. Very polished. Um, and overall, very, very good athlete. And um, he had this crazy balance between, you know, physique and um discipline in his tactics uh was something that resonated with me and i was like damn this is someone i definitely wish i could have you know replicate his fencing style gotcha no that makes sense and and now so we're we're in penn state we're, we're, we're at penn state we're having success what was the what was kind of the progression you know i think a lot about um especially in football going from high school to college to the pro mm -hmm. game there's really distinct kind of learnings and lessons learned to be able to keep up and keep first progress and be, you know, foundationally on the same field and then have your own insights to really take it to the next level. Um, going from club into college, what were, what were some of those biggest takeaways? And then while you were at college, when you first kind of got your bearings and you were like, okay, I'm a collegiate fencer at Penn state now to becoming a top performer. Um, you know, what, what were kind of the different progressions that you felt you had to make? Uh, I, I felt really comfortable the second I got to Penn State. Uh, I, <laughs> um, I was pretty hot headed going uh, going to Penn State. Um, I Prin princess, I right? Princess is or yeah. Um, the second I walked into practice, the first practice, I knew I was better than anyone else on the team, uh, and that's what I told myself, and that's what I carried about my whole entire collegiate career. Um, and, you know, to simmer me down, the upperclassmen on the team would call me princess. Um, but it's okay. I still kicked ass. Like, And I'm sure you brought a whole new dynamic again to the team of, like, the level of intensity, the level of competition, and, and striving to achieve that greatness. Oh, absolutely. We would have, like, mini competitions and uh, within our own practices. Um, we would do, like, King of the Hill bouts, and I would be up there for 45 minutes straight without losing a match. Oh, and my coach would be nagging everyone on the team, like, can anyone beat this kid? And I would just get off to get a water break and then come back and keep doing it again. Um, and But, like, I, it's like, it's crazy. That was the first time I realized, like, how important mentality is. Like, if you can manifest something and, like, just repeat that every day, like, it will happen. It, it just it – just by – the stars aligning. I don't know what it is. Um, if you just manifest that you're the best, that you work hard and things are going to happen, it will. Um, and that was the first time I really recognized that when I was at Penn State. 
Um, I walked in and some people call me hot headed, but I think it was just an abundance of confidence. Yeah, no, I mean, it, life is all about, you know, manifestation, right? It's vibrations. It's your, it's your intent. It's your will and yeah, you bringing go. something that's, you know, truly unique. And I think, you know, elite athletes of, you know, of all sport can resonate with that um, in, in some kind of way, shape or form. It's really cool to, to hear you, you know, you know, speak about that. And as I guess that started to build, I guess, a natural inclination from having that confidence to a step in and be the best at Penn State naturally, probably, you know, naturally led you to then wanting to, you know, participate in the Olympics, or I guess, Talk about from your time at Penn State when, um, obviously, I'm sure the Olympics was on your radar from day one, but when things started to become more and more actionable of, I'm Andrew, the collegiate venture at Penn State that is dominating, mm -hmm. that is doing well. Um, you know, I guess talk a little bit about the career that you had at Penn State and how you yeah, transitioned cool. into the Olympics. So um, I, won, I won my first, my first few years, I won the individual national championships for my principal um and it was that year also where i just was shy of qualifying for the 2016 olympics um and so so let me let me just get this straight so i'm tracking so we won three individual national championships two two, two. two. so freshman and sophomore year yep and and that was what discipline saber right yep so national champions and saber didn't quite qualify for 2016 Th those years so that means that where were those olympic fencers coming from if they weren't in college they were already participating kind of on the pro circuit yeah uh no so one of them was um one of them was uh already an olympian from 2012 and the other one was my teammate who actually grew up we both started the same club at the same age um back in boston and you were the two um, who put boston on the map yeah yeah some really cool stuff. Um, and I was shy of qualifying. And he, if anyone was going to qualify over me, it would, it would be him. So I was like very happy that, you know, he was, but, um, only it was two, so only two qualified within the discipline for, yeah. So in the past, after 2016, they changed the rules where from now on it's going to be top four in the country, but in the past they switched over from top two to top four. Um, so I was a little bummed out when, um, they didn't implement that rule before 2016, but, um, yeah, when I didn't qualify, um, uh, I became team captain of Penn state and now this is your junior year. So yeah, this is my junior year and that I had a really rough junior year. Um, and you talk, you know, you see this a lot in, in sports where people kind of like, you know, as they're going up, they kind of dip a little bit. Mm -hmm um and uh i struggled a lot i mean i was not only just charging myself but i was also in charge of a whole team and you know when you're put in a position like that for the first time it could be a little overwhelming which it was and i was already down on myself and like questioning my ability in fencing after not qualifying for the rio olympics um so uh it was it was a strange period especially going to um throughout my junior year um, didn't do, do too hot, especially after winning two national championships. Um, I still was an all American finished top eight in, you know, at the, uh, instant blaze, um, and then senior year finishing bronze. Um, and, but after that dip, I really, you know, after I graduated Penn state, I, it was a hard transition to figure out whether or not I want to continue, um, going for Tokyo or not. Mm. Um, it started when I started having this like love hate relationship with fencing. Um, cause it's, if you're not enjoying something, you know, you question whether you want to do it or not. Um, especially when you put so much time and commitment into it. Um, and I don't know, <laughs> uh, it took some time, but then I think this past year, especially with COVID, I know the COVID like has done a lot of harm in the world and kind of like, um, impacted a lot of people's lives, but I had to really have to say I found this new profound love for my for my sport and kind of like projected me forward again, like it did back when I was 15 years old. And I love it now. Like I'm just, can't wait to go forward and see what else I can make out of my uh, my uh, endeavors. What What do you think was a was a breakthrough? So so 
you know, we finished top, top A All American junior year, senior year bronze. So still didn't quite eclipse what we accomplished the first two years of college. Um, you know, I assume that that's kind of in the 2019, 2020 kind of range. And yeah. I guess what, what were some of the sparks that reignited that passion in 2020? Where were, where were you competing, um, you know, uh, post Penn State to, to start to really harbor your skills and passion again for the sport? Um, yeah, so after Penn State, I was like, you know what? I've gone this far. I might as well try to make another Olympic team and see how it goes. Um, um, I was living at my parents' house for some some time. I was living in Cambridge with a buddy. I was doing door-to-door sales to make money to uh, finance my fencing endeavors while my friends were out in the corporate world making money. I kind of was thrown into this different um, lifestyle. <laughs> um, and it was tough. I mean, especially when you're like comparing yourself to other people and like seeing what they're doing. It's, you know, you're you question whether you're doing the right or wrong thing. And I was doing the regular competitions so going through the senior circuit, qualifying for senior world championships, something that I've done several times in the past. But it was as if I was forcing it. It was as if, you know, I was taking it as a, as a job instead of something I would enjoy, something that in the past I would always get that extra margin of effort to like get better. Whereas I was just doing the minimum that was expected of myself and, and just like go along with it and see how it went. Um, and that was around like when you said like 2020 um, and things got, I don't know, things got repetitive, nonchalant for me. And then when COVID hit, <laughs> when COVID hit, I was like, all right, cool. I have like a two week vacation. I'm going to pop open a beer and just chill out. But then I realized, oh my God, this is like, this is an epidemic. This is a big thing. This is still going on now, right? This is going on still now today and it's impacting a lot of people. Um, but I used that time to really reflect, um, look at old v- videos of me competing, look at old photos, look at old memories of everything I've done in the past and um, realize this is something that no one can take away from me. And I can, if I, like, I'm doing this because I love it. And I think I was clouded by that. And that was like when I finally realized like the blindfold came out, came off my eyes. And I was like, I can, I can shoot for the stars. Yeah, I think that's that really resonates, you know, with with me and my career. And I think I haven't expressed too much explicitly, but I think for all athletes listening to this, that as athletes, we're so focused on where we're at and where we're trying to go. It gets it it gets really, really hard and cloudy to like understand your journey of why you're here. You know, for for myself, um, you know, I played football at UCF. I was a four year starter. My sophomore and, and my junior year ran into a lot of injury trouble. Uh, had three shoulder surgeries that just kind of got in this wicked spiral of, uh, you know, getting hurt, trying to get better, getting kind of re-injured because our team needed me as a center. You're you're a captain. You're really dictating a lot of the team, so you feel an obligation to be out there. And yeah. for my senior year, I had finished my graduate degrees and really had no obligation to the team. My scholarship paid for my school. Um, and I, I remember kind of trying to make a decision. Everyone was kind of waiting, you know, are you going to play your senior year? Or are you not? And my entire mentality was absolutely not. I am completely kind of done, you know, done with this sport. And I, I'll never forget, it was, you know, around February, the season is in fall. And I was kind of really at a point where I had to make a decision. And one night, exactly like you're saying, going back and looking yeah. at, you know, I started playing tackle football when I was in second grade, third grade. And my dream was to play in the NFL was to be a professional. And the fact that injuries, not injuries, whatnot, I was a top 10 ranked player at my position, had every opportunity. And all that was standing in the way was six months of hard work and dedication to a sport that I loved forever. Right. And, and that made it put so much perspective yeah. into my head of like, reigniting that passion reigniting that 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 love and you know long story short put my 100 percent into it and got re-injured first game of my senior year which which ended my career but regardless i think in the spirit of what you're saying of of kind of paying respect to your journey as an athlete and 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 looking at the sum of everything that's been put into the sport and and to, to what it's made you of, of having a huge impact so that's that's 
really, really exciting to hear and um, would love to kind of from there talk about, you know, when you qualified for the Olympics, like how, how that resonated, you know, bringing back kind of the manifestation, right. You know, you, you, re did you, you, from there in finding that passion and that love, you refound kind of your, your confidence and, and how did that begin to carry itself into qualifying? Yeah. Um, so once I qualified, I kind of blacked out. I was like, this is too good to be true. Well, and how, how did that happen, right? So, so we, you know, 2020 hits, we get, yeah. we, we reignite the passion. You go on the senior tour and, you know, give me like, give me the, the movie, give me the cinematic moment. Like, you know, we're, we're in a competition and you have to win X to be in the top three or in the top four, you know, give me a little, a, a little. So, um, there's a set of qualifiers that we have throughout the year and you get a certain amount of points um for each. the better the view the more points you get mm -hmm. and they all accumulate and at the end of the year if you're top four in the country first top four with the top four most points qualify for olympics and um before covid hit we were supposed to have one more olympic qualifier but everything got shut down so it was in, until for a whole year a uh, whole year goes by the following march we have our last olympic qualifier so the whole year, I'm like training. I'm like, I don't even know if the Olympics is going to happen. What am I training for? Should, should I continue getting a job and finance my fencing, or should I like just quit and just go into corporate world? Um, oh my god! It, like, sorry, I'm smiling and everything because it's such like a roller coaster of of just like seven, eight months of like anticipation of waiting for that like last qualifier. Yeah, and um. It happens. I finished second best in the U.S. at the Olympic qualifier, and I solidified my position to go to um, Tokyo. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and the fourth spot. So the first, second, and third people, were, and I was third in the country. So we were uh, solidified with our um, position, but for the fourth spot, was still open between three other guys, three of my teammates. So that was kind of a grind for them because they still had one more domestic qualifier to go to. Gotcha. Um, to figure out who's going to go. But for me, you know, I saved the mental stress of, you know, That's having to go through the competition. Gotcha. So we we did it. We did it. Uh, a match. We, we did it, Joe. We did it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm invested in this journey at, at this point, man. It's just, I, I feel like I'm in the trenches. So talk to me a little bit about when your first kind of like pinch me or moment of building up to the Olympics or when you, you know, actually get to Tokyo or, you yeah. know, just talk a little bit about your first real moment as an Olympian um, All right. and, and how special that was. Um, so we had, you know, a few tra uh, training camps before going to the Olympics. We went to Rome for two, uh, a week and a half to train with the Italian national team. They invited us to go up there. Um, and I trained with Aldo Montano, uh, my, you know, your idol, uh, my idol. Yeah. I actually ran into him in 2016 in a, um, international competition. I barely lost, I like almost beat him. And I think I didn't beat him because I was going to be so shocked. If I beat him. <laughs> um, yeah. And he like patted me on the shoulder and he was like, you're good, you're good. I was like, all right. So anyway, you know, fast forward, you know, five years later, um, in his training center, training with him, fencing against him um, and his teammates. Um, and that was really cool. That's, um, I you know, trained before with other uh, international teams, but, you know, just leading up to the Olympics, everyone's, there's this like feeling in this air, this, this, this uh, aroma that like you and your other teammates and other people that are going to be competing from another country, like you're all training for a higher purpose. And um, then we went to Los Angeles, you know, days before we went to Tokyo. Um, we got to Tokyo. I had to wait 11 hours at the airport. Oh. Apparently, there was a false positive um, uh, COVID. result COVID result on someone who was flying with us from L.A. to Tokyo. And um, <laughs> for 11 hours, we're, we're put in this room. They're giving us, like, rice balls these like rice cakes right to eat and i'm like sleeping on my couch oh my god um finally like you know 11 hours goes by and we get to the olympic village and um 
honestly, maybe you guys can like sub link this, but like, you know that like that meme video of the football player who's like, I got my swagger back. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I that's exactly if you guys can add it, that would be so funny. Add it, um, add it in there, Leland. He'll he'll hear it. Uh <laughs> dude, like I was like, damn, it's like five o'clock in the morning, no one's out. Like, we just got in, we just dropped off our stuff in our in our you know uh, apartment space with our other roommates, and we go to the 24-hour dining hall. Um, and we you walk in the street and like no one's up yet, but you can, you know, like in a few hours, there's going to be like athlete university, like athletes walking around everywhere. So it was really cool. It was like this really like sentimental, like emotional feeling for me walking at five o'clock in the morning to the dining hall before. And it was the only time I didn't see anyone at the Olympics because uh, the other times you're going to bed early, you're waking up early and you see other athletes. So that was something really cool. I had, I felt like I was the only one, the first person to show up at the Olympic village, even though everyone was sleeping. Um, and that's where I was like, I'm going to own this. I'm going to own it. I got my swagger back. I got my swagger back. Oh, my swagger back. Ooh. Back. oh I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, all right. Uh, so now we're at the Olympic Village. We got the swagger back. Talk about just some of the most impactful moments that you had at the Olympics, um, you know, from, you know, different moments and in, in, in matches to, you know, your ultimate kind of final result uh, in Tokyo. Yeah, um, so like we're training, you know, it was like I didn't get to go to the opening ceremony because the next morning we're, we compete and to save our legs, uh, we decided to opt out from it. Um, and days before that, we're training at the U.S. Uh, training facility. Um, and, um, you, you know, when you take the bus from the Olympic Village to the training center, you do like everyone's like by themselves. A few people are talking, but I would always just put in my headphones. Um, I actually have an iPod Nano first generation that I, you know, first listened to when I started fencing and I brought that along with me. I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to listen to what I listened to back in the day. And it was like Eminem, like crack a bottle, um, Ooh, crack a bottle, let your body yeah, bottle. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else is on it? It was Mike Posner, some of Mike Posner's old stuff, Ooh. um, all American rejects, some 41, um, Green Day, Green Day was, was big back in the day for me. Um, so I was just like just locked and loaded. I was like, I feel fresh. I feel like at ease. And I was anticipating to compete. I think the biggest moment for me was just being on the strip. Um, you know, the lights are all on you. Everything's dark, but everything on the strip is lit up. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I've been training for. It's exactly what I wanted. I was there to compete, and it's where I feel most natural. That's what I feel most natural as an athlete and, you know, competing. Um, your heartbeat races up a little bit. Adrenaline kicks in. You know, all other athletes know this. You know, moments before kickoff, moments before um, uh, the fencing bout starts or anything happens, the match starts. Uh, and I felt alive, and I... Honestly, like it's strange. Like most people, like get really like nervous and everything. I, I didn't. I was so at ease. I felt so composed, and I was ready to rock and roll the second I got on the syrup. And so, you know, we did. How, how long over the course of the Olympics was your kind of competing timeline? Um, you know, what what? How many days was that? And mm -hmm. where where did we finish? Um, yeah. So individual everything is one day you know day. individuals is all one day then you have a four-day break and then you have the team event you finish all that and then boom the next day you get sent home um because you had 48 hours to get sent home by the, the japanese government there's no you know yeah there's no lingering around with there's no lingering around yeah <laughs> um, so i was in and out of there and you know everything happened in a flash but i really soaked up every single second i was up there competing that's awesome man and then I guess next up is 2024. Um, you know, what, what is the mindset now, you know, from, le uh, you know, leaving Tokyo of, of what's next for, for Andrew and his fencing yeah. journey, right? What, uh, where's the mindset? What are we doing kind of in between? Um, just listen, like, you know, you're an athlete, you know, what you got to do in the gym, you know how to take care of your body. I've been doing this for so long um, that I'm not even like, you know, second guess myself you know whether i'm like taking care of myself it's it's at this point it's like second nature um but really just like keeping a cool head i think 
mentally for myself going to Paris. Um, just like I said, I got my swagger back um, hey. and just ride with it. Snowball effect. Keep going with it. And what does the training regimen look like? Is it daily right now? Are you taking some time? You know, as you think about kind of from now, you know, the fall of 2021 yeah. to 2024. Are you going to, is it going to be kind of a slow ramp? Is it pretty steady? Um, so I did, I did a lot of training, but you know, it was pretty much everything I was doing um, before Tokyo. Uh, I was, you know, lifting four times a week with my trainer, Mike, um, Mike Duran, shout out to Mike Duran back in Boston. Shout out Mike. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, and he did a phenomenal job of getting me, you know, tip top shape. Um, but now, you know, um, things change. I moved to New York city. I'm working. Uh, so my schedule is a little, you know, different than it was in the past. But just as long as you're being efficient, you can go forward with it. I wish I had, you know, one point five million dollars like LeBron James does to spend on my body to make sure I'm recovering well. But um, I am doing PT now. I have, you know, a trainer here that I'm working with. Um, uh, I'm, uh, you know, fencing four times a week, five times a week. Um, I do boxing at least once a week. Uh, just spice it up a little bit, you know, get it keep it on my toes and, you know, try something new. Uh, boxing is great. Love boxing. Yeah. Definitely advise all other athletes to just give it a try. You see already a bunch of like athletes already doing it. Damian Lillard, for example, um, for the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, I think it's a great cardio workout and just like mentally, you know, if you just want to get some anger out, you just. And, and, and footwork, right? I mean, that was like, when I got really into boxing, you know, boxers and the way they move and da, 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 moving in and out, you know, rotating yeah. around, kind of creating different angles that I'm sure is, you know, very relevant in fencing. But it's something like fencing and boxing that have in common, I think, is is it's an art. You know, it's sure you have to be athletic, but at the same time, there's so much creativity and um, uh, you can improvise so much with it um, that it's kind of like a dance. It's kind of an art, which I love. Um, you can be as creative as you want. Uh, definitely give two thumbs up to boxing. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, last kind of question for you as we as we as we round this out, um, and have loved kind of diving in and hearing your story. But what do you think fencing has given you most as a person? You know, outside of the sport. I know we talked a little bit about you know just the training, the work ethic, the mental side of it. You got your swagger back, the manifesting. Like, what what would you say ultimately? Um, you know, you appreciate most about the sport and what it's done for you, you know, not just as an athlete, but as a person. Um, I definitely have to say, I really appreciate some of the people I've met in my life through fencing. Um, I, when I was struggling my junior year, there was this man, um, Howard Sanders, who was battling cancer, beat it twice, but eventually passed away um because of the you know the toll that took on his body and he believed he believed in me more than anyone else has ever believed in my life and like every day he was sending me an encouraging text message like one of those like you know instagram accounts of like supportive positive um thomas and um he really like made me believe who i am today and He's just one of the few people that's so impactful in your life. And I'm sure other athletes can resonate to this. Like some people just go out of their way to help you out because they believe in you more than you believe in yourself. And because of that, I I just really hope I can impact other people's lives and do some good in the future um, and just give back to the community as much as the community has given back to me. That's amazing, man. You can't always be, you know, totally strong for yourself. So it's those people that are your teammates, are your mentors, are people that you meet at the right time in your life that can help, you know, reinstill and 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 provide strength for you when when you're not completely strong yourself. So that's you know super powerful and people people right and, you know yeah. in addition to the sport it's people. So appreciate it's, that. it's yeah it's just like I tell this to a lot of like young athletes, um, especially in fencing. Like you can get somewhere quickly by yourself. But if you want to get somewhere far, you need a group of people. You need a community around you. Um, and just as much as they support you, it's important to support them back. So you, you don't want to build a taller fence. You want to build a bigger table, share the success, share the wealth, um, share the, the dream. 
if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Right. I think that's, that's, uh, that's, that's an old, old homage. Well, cool. Andrew, I appreciate your time. You know, amazing from, you know, not fencing, not being your passion. And initially you were soccer guy, Cristiano Ronaldo to developing a love and a passion to eventually the excellence coming into Penn state as the young guy with confidence, finding your swagger, getting to the Olympics. It's, been an amazing journey. Thank you for coming on and sharing it uh, with me and with the platform. Appreciate it. No, thank you, Joey, for having me. It was, it was a pleasure.